All right, well, we've got a panel starting now on the role of AI in the future of business communication. So if the panelists will please come up and join me on the stage, that would be great. Uh, I think you can sit wherever, wherever works for you. We don't have it on the main screen for a second, but I'm sure they'll fix that very, very soon. All right, brilliant. So we're continuing our discussion of AI, of course, with this panel on the role of AI in the future of business communications, um, joined by all of our different speakers. So obviously we've got bandwidth, double zoom, ring central, and audio codes all on the stage. Why don't we just go down from me and we'll just introduce ourselves. Just say who you are, where you're from, and what you're doing in the world of AI. Starting here? Yeah, starting here. Excellent. I'm Jason Gilligan. I am head of strategic business development at Zoom. Um, Zoom's doing quite a few different things um, within the AI realm. Um, Magnus talked about it earlier within our meeting summaries. That's kind of what, what we're highlighting right now, and we have a lot of announcements that are coming in two weeks at Enterprise Connect. Hmm. Brilliant. Michael, how about you? Hi, Michael Weeding. I'm from Daba. I'm uh, Director of Product. We've been working with AI in the last few years more focused on conversation intelligence and extracting value out of every conversation that we call Daba Moments um, and delivering that as out-of-the-box um, solutions with a focus on delivering immediate business value to particularly SMB mid-market businesses. Brilliant. And Felipe? Hi, my name is Philippe Letal. I'm part of Ring Central's um, Global Service Providers Organization. We have been in a very long journey now for the past two years of introducing AI into all the, um, all the kind of uh, um, products that we have in a portfolio. And part of my role is also to make sure that our service providers are able to consume that and propose that to the end consumers as well. Brilliant. And John, how about you? I'm John Bell, uh, Chief Product Officer at Bandwidth. Our focus has really been bit different from what you've seen from Mother's Day. It's been focused on integrating, helping enterprises integrate applications into their comm stack. So that does include the big AI engines. But almost every category of application that we look at has AI in it as well. And so there's a lot of activity happening as we help enterprises integrate into their comm stacks. Uh, brilliant. And then, no, a bit strange. Uh, the name is missing from my list. I'll just oh. introduce myself. Introduce yourself, yourself please. Yeah, thank yeah, you. John Zolte, I'm contact center subject matter expert at Audio Codes. Uh, in short, we have been voice specialists for the last 30 years in terms of SVCs and voice infrastructure. More latterly, in, in the last few years, involved in AI in terms of contact center, in terms of integration with chatbots, voice bots, Teams meetings, and all other areas of, of AI as well. Absolutely. Okay. Sorry about that little mix up. Um, so I guess the first area we're going to turn to just to discuss is this idea of products. And I guess in the last year, we've heard this idea of rapid development um, in terms of things of changing direction has changed. So I guess the question for the panel is, how has your own direction changed in product in the last year? Do you want to take us away? I'll take us away. Sure. I think one of the ways that Zoom's really kind of changed is making sure that we make products that are easy to use and relevant today. I think there's a lot of hype and a lot of talk about like what AI is, what's going to be. We heard earlier on the panel today is like sometimes less is more. Mm. And when you look at like what Zoom's doing around meeting summarization, it's actually something that can be used today. It's something that I use. I, I've been traveling the last two weeks and having the meeting summarization, being able to go and look like, all right, take a, a two minute read of it and be like, all right, now I can go actually look at the transcript if I need to go dive into deeper into it and then go look at the video if I need to know exact context or how somebody's tone was. So this is actually real world applicable things you're able to do today and there's not like the, the hype around like what could this actually be and what, what does that look like? Yeah, we're the same. I mean, look, it's more than a year. I think the real challenge is, is AI and the, the promise of it could solve any problem in the world and do everything from solve world hunger, world peace to, you know, interpreting what people are talking about, you know, in a conversation. Um, the challenge for that is businesses have got to understand the value they're going to get from it and does it solve a real world problem. And I think, as you probably heard and as you said, is you've got to reduce the complexity. You've got to be able to bring something that is delivers immediate value and something that is not complex or confusing for someone to use and set up because the world out there and the business, the customers you're talking to are very are, are getting bombarded and are very confused so a few years ago we made that deliberate attempt all about simplification 
Yeah, so for the past, uh, I would say that for the past two years, we have been in this um, a journey to become a, a multi-product organization. And um, as we do it, we have been taking that chance to introduce AI in all aspects of our portfolio as well. Uh, I think the most notorious is the creation of a platform that is called RingSense. Uh, that is really the AI engine behind a lot of the conversational intelligence that is powering our products as well. Uh, but it will also see AI being introduced in some of the elements um, that are part of UCAS. It's, it's been, it's been a really a, a, um, an interesting timing um, and uh, is really shaping Ring Central to become an AI centric uh, organization. As, as we look at the ecosystem, I think there's an opportunity for us to make the ecosystem a lot bigger. Because today you've been hearing a lot of traditional telecom companies talk about AI. But when you listen to look at the business problem, the research that Cavell's presented, there, there's some business problems around productivity um, and reducing costs. AI might actually be more productive around other IT applications in the ecosystem. And so from our perspective, we look at it as a, really a network effect from the number of apps that we can bring into the comms stack. So to us, that's the opportunity. Are there other applications that, that we don't think of as being communications companies today that could actually really impact the bottom line and productivity of the enterprise. So that's where our focus has been. There's a lot of applications. We just saw, I think in their terminology, it was um, synchronous and asynchronous. You can imagine in a call flow that there will be multiple active and passive applications watching, influencing, and taking part of a call flow. And that's the opportunity. And to do it with companies and technologies that aren't part of comms today. So that's what's really informing our roadmap as we invest. Cool. Uh, so on the audio code side, probably three key areas over the last couple of years that we've looked at. First is probably on the enterprise side, where people are already advanced in, in the AI world in terms of chatbots, voice bots, speech to text, and cognitive services. Probably a daily job at the moment doing pre-integration with what seems to be a new chatbot provider or cognitive services that pops up every day. So doing pre-integrations with those is, is probably a daily, daily chore. Uh, on the other side of the scale, you've got customers, probably more in the SMB market, who are wanting to dip their toe into the world of AI, haven't quite made that jump yet. So we're doing products in terms of contact center, conversational IVR, similar to, to Zoom with a meeting recaps and summarization recording of, of uh, Microsoft Teams meetings. And then the other bit we've been quite conscious of actually in the middle is Believe it or not, coming to an event like this, there are still customers that haven't gone to cloud yet. So there are some on-premise infrastructures out there and actually giving them some AI tools in terms of things like uh, live transcription and call summaries for those on-premise that, that haven't actually moved to, to cloud yet in the contact center world as well. So not ignoring those guys. So probably all ends of the, uh, the spectrum from, from our point of view. That's really interesting. I hadn't really thought that much about the people not in the cloud trying to do AI, but I guess everyone does want those upgrades if they can get them, even if they're not fully in the cloud yet. And there are a lot of large companies like governments and things like that that haven't transitioned to the cloud because they don't trust it, that still need that optimization. Um, so moving then on, I think, to pricing models, which is quite an interesting topic. We've seen various attempts, you know, making it a monthly add-on, uh, making it a you know, service you purchase, and a lot of people giving away AI for free as well. I guess the question is, if you're selling something that feels like a little upgrade, like transcription on call recording, do you charge for it, or you know, are we only charging for the massive deployments of AI? You know, how, is it a chargeable product, or is it something that people are going to expect just to add it on? I know Zoom aren't charging for it all the time, so it's a good person to ask. <laughs> no, it, it is. Uh, so we don't charge for our, our basic AI products, but uh, you know, Ben Neo is going to be on a, a contact center. Um, panel later this afternoon talking about some of that. You know, we do have different tiers of our our contact center product that has different AI features built in based on kind of what that looks like. So you're you're certainly going to see, I think, more of a probably a shift to kind of like models on full or featured AI having probably additional add-ons in the future. Yeah, I think I think pricing's a um, interesting and challenging question because the technology is not cheap. 
right? And, um, you know, and that's bringing, again, going to be the biggest risk that most um, will have is, you know, the solution that you're bringing to market, is it economical? And how do you ensure that it's commercial? Because we aren't sure exactly what everyone's going to be paying, you know, over the next few years for it. And obviously it's been given away for free in some elements, but when you're delivering something of value, people pay for value, but for how much? Um, so I think the pricing piece on this is, is, you know, we think that pricing will always be challenged. It'll, be, it'll need to be delivered at low cost, right? and it will need to be then developed through there once you demonstrate value. So if you can't get in and deliver value at low cost to demonstrate, because as, as you just pointed out in your research, still people are unsure what value they're going to get from this investment. So dropping something onto their table that's quite a considerable investment when they're still not sure of the value is going to be a real challenge. So how do you get low cost in to start them on the journey and then build the confidence down the line where they're prepared to pay more? Yeah, I think from a Ring Central perspective, we, we take a quite pragmatic approach. So we obviously charge uh, per market uh, value for every single feature that we have, not only AI. But when we look at AI, obviously there is, um, there is a part of AI that is pretty much uh, commoditized. When you look at closed captions, live transcriptions, I mean, um, those have been part of our uh, base packages since, since very early stages uh, when we introduced those features there. Uh, for the more advanced um, call insights and post call insights, we, we are, I think we are still in the process of understanding where this uh, should go. Um, I mean, in the end, it's also about the value that we are creating and offering customers. Um, and yeah, we are still in that process and seeing where the, uh, with also the, the, the market's going to respond to the introduction of AI here. I'll give you a product answer, which is you got to look at the application. I think when you look at some of the applications, um, it's going to get rolled into the pricing. But there are, there are opportunities for applications using AI to really change the value proposition of the category of the app. If you're going to make fraud detection materially better, you should do value-based pricing. If you're going to make your agents more effective materially, use value-based pricing. So I think there's a range depending on the application and how AI is actually being used in the app and how impactful it is the business outcome. So the short answer is yes, it's chargeable. Um, whether you bake it in, whether you do it as a value add and charge on top, yes, there's always going to be a cost attributed to it. I suppose it depends on the customer and probably just to roll up what everyone's already said with things like cognitive services when we're building out our contact center product with cognitive services, we're building that into the cost. Now that can be to some degree relatively easy to control uh, when you're talking about large language models and rerunning data, that has a, a heavy, hard cost to it. So when you're looking at integrating chatbots and doing automation and voice bots in the contact center world, then that's going to be more of a subscription and, a, and either a session-based price or a, uh, or a minutes-based price. But I think, as the guys have already said, when you're looking at adding value, when you're automating something, you're actually, you're getting a value out of that automation. So the more you automate, the more value you're getting, and therefore the more it pays for itself anyway. So while costs can kind of go up without that control of it being built in, if you're on a, a per session or per minute cost, the more you use, the more you're benefiting anyway. So it, it kind of counteracts that anyway, so. Mm, I think that's a really series of good answers. I mean, obviously there's a lot of benefit that you can quantify to the businesses and the companies you're selling it to. And as you get more and more use cases, obviously the cost that you're gonna get out of it, the savings you're gonna get, the actual value to the business becomes very quantified. So maybe we just need a few good case studies to get us started. But it is definitely an interesting topic, especially when you're competing with the likes of ChatGPT, which allows quite a lot of free queries that are really not free on the back end, as we all know. I mean, it's all marketing costs to them, but you don't have Google Bard's marketing costs, you know, all the time. So it's a bit of an interesting topic. Um, moving on then, probably to a hard question to answer, which is what is the impact of AI on headcounts? I mean, we think that AI is going to make all these companies more efficient. That will, in theory, reduce the number of people they need to do different jobs. Does that mean that we're on the cusp of seeing a large reduction in the number of users that are going to be using communications and collaboration platforms? It's a, it's a great question, and I don't think there's going to be an immediate huge headcount um, reduction. I think kind of something I thought about here is like, AI is not necessarily coming for my job. Mm. Somebody that knows how to use AI is coming for my job. And I think that's probably a better way to look at it in the short term. Mm. 
Yeah, probably not a question I'm qualified to answer, but I'd say I can already see new roles being developed, you know, every day, and we're looking into new roles that are going to be created to support what you develop and you build, which don't exist today. So while, while some roles might not exist in the future, other roles will definitely be created. I think that's a, that's a great question. It's not tough at all. I mean, um, I think most people, when they look at AI, they tend to think that AI is going gonna, is gonna to come here to, to get our jobs. Um, but um, when, when, when we look at um, AI at Brink Central, I think we have a more positive outlook. Um, we, we really believe that AI is going to be introduced to, to, to make people doing a better job uh, and empower, empowering those people. Uh, and also by doing that, if you think about it, you're, go, you're going to expand the, the, the range of uh, employable people using this kind of technology, right? And uh, while you do that, uh, you're also cutting on the need of training. Uh, so you're going to be probably saving some costs by doing that. But in general, uh, it, we don't really believe this is about cutting jobs. It's kind of about empowering people to do, to do a better job um, on a daily basis. And you, you had a slide where you said that you have 12% of people saying that they still interact, like to interact uh, more with humans. I'm probably part of those of those 12% uh, uh, of people who really like to do it. Um, so I think in the end, AI is going to go there to, to empower the people that will be on, your, uh, on the other end of the phone and, and perhaps expanding that range of people that could be there. So I don't think so. I think it's going to make, um, it's going to increase productivity. But at the same time, AI is going to be pervasive in your entire life. It's also going to raise expectations of your of the consumer on what they expect out of interactions with enterprises. And so I think it will make the agents and the employees more productive, but at the same time, enterprises will be asked to do more by their users. And so I think it's just going to escalate um, both the needs and demands as well as the productivity at the same time. So I actually think it's going to be a bit of a wash. I'd love to say I disagree, but no, I, I, I agree pretty much with, with what the guys have already said. I think it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to aid and augment the human interaction element rather than replace it. Uh, I think I, I could probably spend hours on, on this one, to be fair, but in the contact center world, you have a number of things that can be done by AI. You can automate payments lines. You can automate the day your bins are being collected and all sorts of tasks. What you then need to do is have someone that actually runs these automations and actually plugs them in and actually builds them. You've then got, and we've seen it with, with a number of enterprise customers actually using what were specifically cost, uh, contact center agents, their best place to look at the conversational design element and actual customer experience. So when you're going through and you're speaking to a voice bot, We've probably already been, we've all been there where you're speaking to someone, they repeat back, did you say this? No, I didn't. Did you say this? Yes, I did. No, I didn't. You end up getting quite annoyed with a voice bot sometimes. And actually having contact center agents who understand the customer journey, building those and actually building the conversational flow as to what good looks like uh, and what is a good customer journey and experience actually just reutilizes the same people in, in different roles. So pretty much what, what everyone said, I think it's going to augment with, with the humans. It's going to help on the automation side and actually add value across the board. Mm, brilliant. I think there were some very, very interesting things said there. I mean, one of the, the things I'd like to draw out is the firstly, the comment um, from Philippe that, um, you know, what we don't realize, and we did, of course, have a panel that focused heavily on accessibility and how that's being boosted by AI earlier, is that there's actually a very huge percentage that as AI solutions get more advanced, the amount of people who you know, are currently not capable of working in the workforce because of various disabilities and, and issues, suddenly can because they have assistance that can help them do the job. And in terms of, you know, the UK economy on a scale, if you add 2% or even 1% extra workers to the workforce, that has massive benefits. Um, and the other thing, of course, I liked, um, which John Bell said, was very much the expectations of what is expected of us as a business will increase because the quality of things should theoretically increase if we're all being assisted by AI, which suddenly means that your consumer expectations of what they're actually getting from you 
skyrocket and then you probably have to keep all the staff to deliver on those expectations even though you've got this AI assistance theoretically making you more productive so I think it's very very but, interesting but don't don't underestimate the human effort behind you know uh, you know what Philip said it's a bit like okay well this is just a computer system doing some work actually mm. you know, behind the scenes AI isn't just about computer program running and self-learning it needs to be managed yeah. right? it needs to have controls put around it that needs humans to do that so there is actually as as sexy as it might want to sound at the top end right there's a lot of manual work around it and particularly as we move into an era where we we're going to be um, accountable from a responsible AI perspective more so you know not just from our own personal ethical pieces but more legislative there's going to be a lot of humans behind the scenes so to get the outputs you need that maintain quality that, that deliver the right output that is responsible right there's going to be there's a lot of work that sits behind the scenes so it's not just the computer doing its own thing yeah exactly the sci-fi image of a ai coming in and doing everything for you is is many many decades away hopefully um, <laughs> so moving on then i think to talk about adoption so i guess what are the main challenges because you know, a lot of you have AI solutions, you are rolling them out to customers. So what are the main challenges that you've seen in those adoptions and like how much does that vary based on company size? I, I think the, I mean, we saw some of the stats earlier and I think it's what we're seeing in Zoom as well is like some of the larger organizations are, are very, very nervous about what this means and making sure they have a comprehensive policy in place before they kind of roll it out. Um, I think that some of the smaller companies are a little bit more agile, a little bit more kind of willing to, to uh, um, experiment with it. Um, that being said, you know we, we have a very big adoption for our, our meeting summaries, which I think, when you look at the kind of the AI kind of entry um, for it into the foray, it is pretty low bar. It's uh, not not a lot of risk. You're not having a lot of data out there. You know, it's, it's in a closed ecosystem. So, I think that's really what we're going to have to see, kind of probably over the next you know year is really comprehensive policies by the large enterprises to be able to go figure out how they're actually going to go and deal with this. I, I think the answer that I've got is more value, right? Demonstrating value, and I think that's the real critical part for adoption is you have to be fast to demonstrate time to value, uh, because you know once again you're solving a real real problem that a business has, and you can demonstrate that you're quickly able to solve that for them. I think that's probably the key key part for adoption because everyone's excited about the opportunities and looking for ways to use this technology and they've been promised a lot of really cool outcomes um, but it's been able to demonstrate that those outcomes can be achieved and achieved quickly because if any investment they're going to make in it you know has to return a commercial benefit very quickly because there's going to be someone else knocking on their door 10 minutes later offering them something else what we have been observing at Ring Central is, in fact, in line with what you presented before. Um, I mean, there is there is a lot of resistance due to trust. Um, people still um, face some resistance in understanding uh, how data is collected because AI is data centric anyway. Uh, how data is collected, how um, is inputting the models that we use, and how these models eventually will will produce something. So. The way we have been, um, you know, uh, mitigating uh, that those those challenges at Ring Central is in, in, in empowering and also ensuring that we have uh, a transparent outlook. Uh, so we have been charging our trust center, our public trust center, that every customer can 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 look at and consume, to make sure that. Um, they understand exactly what is being done with the data that it is being collected and how the inputs have been generated. So yes, uh, challenge trust, response transparency. I say one of the biggest challenges we've seen is is actually the data, right? Which, which data are you bringing into the into the call flow to really be impactful? Because it it is very likely data that has never been part of the real time call flow before. It might have been in a system that your agent is using while they're uh, taking the call, but how do you actually bring together those data sources together that may have never been brought together, and certainly not in real time, to really provide um, the business impact you're looking for? And so, you know, is the reporting, analytics, insights, is it, is it already, is it open? Can you bring it together in real time? Can you use it in real time? I think that's one of the real challenges. When you get to the application level, you start to see is, can we really bring the data together, point AI at it, train it, to then make a meaningful impact in the, in the business? 
Yeah, just to echo, so we're, we're seeing issues, uh, I suppose, from people in terms of the data and where's it going? Is it, is it public internet? Is it our own data? Where's it stored? I think even on a fundamental level, the first issue that, 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 that we come across is people and technical leads and IT leads being told by sort of management, go and invest and do something in AI. And the question is, well, what do you mean AI? And they go, well, I don't know. You're the IT guy, AI stuff. <laughs> Uh, and then it's a case of, well, how do I dip my toe in the water? How do I start? Where do I start? You look at a, you Google AI, you're going to see a billion logos and companies you've never, ever heard of. And are some of them been around for a while? Are some of them fly by night? I don't know. So even that initial conversation is, is really tricky. You've then got the fact that most businesses and pretty much any that I've seen so far don't have an AI budget. So it's not a UC budget, it's not a contact center budget, you're fighting for something new that doesn't even exist. And it's quite difficult without really, really strong use cases to have a hard ROI to say, you know, to, to, to the powers that be, you invest two million, three million, and it'll, it'll make savings of six million. It's very difficult to put that on, on paper, I suppose, and prove it. So even before you get to the data bits, you, you, you're struggling with, with that element that people are, are probably having difficulty with. I think just to add on real quick on, on your point there as well, is that the cloud has made AI actually more difficult as well. It's supposed to be like, where is the cloud, right? Like, where is that data actually being residing? And, you know, I mean, they're not here, but like on this panel, but Microsoft put $3 billion into Germany into AI over the next like two years, right? I mean, there's a reason that they have to do that to keep all of that data residency there for that. So I think that trying to make sure that the, especially within the EU, what that looks like and where that data actually resides is going to be a big cost that we're going to have here going forward. Yeah, and you've kind of jumped into my next point. So we talked about how your customers feel about it and issues there, but I guess the question, and if you haven't, great, uh, but if you have, like, how have any of you ran in, run into any sort of large regulatory stumbling blocks? I mean, the obvious one is Germany, you know, data sovereignty and those kind of things. It, has anyone run into any other ones that they want to talk about? Yes, um, so we do, we do have data centers, I mean, in, in Germany, and we just announced uh, one last week in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as well. Um, so I think, you know, as, as you look at some of these very like regulated countries, they, they want to keep everything in country, in the cloud, you're having to build uh, quite a bit of infrastructure within that country and keep everything there. So, you know, we look at like what we talked about, like, is this going to be free? Like, no, it's not going to be free because you're spending a lot of money for, for this kind of technology. I don't, I'm not about just about data. I mean, data and, um, you know, um, its protection and other things is a pretty well-trodden path. I think the new thing that's coming out now, and we were, we just went through, um, requested by one of our partners, and one of their customers, the first audit of our responsible AI principles, making sure how their data was being used aligned with our AI. Um, and um, that, that was a new requirement that I think is going to become a lot more um, requested over time. So what we were able to have to do in that audit was just Dem demonstrate back to their auditors our responsible AI principles and how we were protecting data, particularly you know through our platforms and, and adhering to those policies. So we've had our first one. I would expect them to be coming a lot more stronger um, down the line. And um, if you if you're not using models that you develop and other things, I think it is going to be very very challenging to be able to demonstrate that how you're protecting the data and how AI is using that data. And if you cannot do that, I think that is going to be the most uh, challenging problem that's going to need to be faced down the line, particularly if you're just using open platforms, even if you're paying for exclusive access, if you don't manage or control what that output is doing, you may not be able to sort of demonstrate how you're providing protection around their data, a customer's data being used in that model. Well, at Brink Central, we have uh, been certainly pay paying attention to what is uh, what is happening at the regulatory level. Um, I would say that obviously there is no um, specific outcome yet uh, on, on, on AI principles, but there is already a lot in data, which is basically the backbone of any AI engine and model. And um, obviously, we have been following and we've been working a, a lot and investing a lot of to be compliant with all the data protection regulations across the world. We see AI not being too much different from that. We have also been providing our inputs uh, whenever needed uh, to the to the regulations, but we are keeping an eye on that. So, so I, I agree. When you look at the way um, regulations looked at the data, 
I think you just have to really be prepared for first, um, different regulations, country by country. So you need to be prepared for different national outcomes. And then you have to be prepared for vertical outcomes, right? We're here in a very highly regulated industry. Our customers in the enterprise are in also in highly regulated um, industries. And we're just starting to see what does AI mean in healthcare? What does it mean in healthcare in the UK? What does it mean in the US? And so there's, I think it's actually going to get a little complex when you start looking at both the vertical implications and the national implications of the underlying data and the policies that come out. So I actually think it's going to get a little complex over time, and we would think we all have to be prepared for that. Uh, I suppose, luckily enough, for, for, for anyone that has audio codes, we've kind of been handling these kind of things in, in the voice world for a number of years, actually, with different countries. It kind of mirrors the voice infrastructure, which is, yes, there are certain countries that have issues with uh, on-premise or cloud. You then have, I think, to add to that, it's, it's almost an interpretation that I think is the issue in some of those countries. So some of those countries are happy for um, hosting to be in country, but some of those will allow data to go outside of the country as long as it's hosted in the country. Some of them will interpret it a completely different way and say, no, everything has to remain in country. I think the issue a lot of people come across is it's an interpretation of law that there are many strict ones that they kind of understand. But it's been the same that Audio Codes have been doing for, for a number of years. We can deploy cloud on-premise, <laughs> customer clouds, it, anywhere, I guess. So it, it kind of mirrors what we've been doing for, for a number of years in the voice world. And just to wrap us up, and we'll start at the other end of the panel for this, because I know you've had to say I echo once or twice. Um, but looking then to the future, I mean, we talked about AI, and lots of talk about AI during the day. Is this going to be the differentiator for the next few years? Like, at what point does what we've been talking about become table stakes across the industry? And, and then, I mean, where is the differentiation coming from? Uh, at the moment, I'd say, it, it, to some degree, it is a differentiator, let's say today. There, there's a few people slightly further ahead than, than others. Um, as I mentioned, things like, you know, there's chatbot and voice bot companies out there that, that might not do agent assist yet in terms of popping up information to, uh, as you saw earlier, popping up information to agents, giving them next best actions. Not everyone's doing that. So th there's a slight differentiator. There will be a point where it's a me too. Um, and everyone has AI in inverted commas and it's pretty much table stakes. But I think differentiator, probably what was touched on earlier actually about vertical markets, I think people doing uh, things like their own LLMs and not relying on, on some of the big ones, having their own internally. And probably, and we even saw it literally last couple of days, actually Microsoft have already done it with Copilot for Finance, for example, and having very specific marketplace or verticals uh, where it's specifically aimed at, so rather than this generic AI word that, that kind of means everything and nothing at the same time to, to people, having very specific vertical markets that it's aimed at is, is probably where I see a differentiator come in, at least in the next 12 months anyway. So, so I actually think it's more than a differentiator. I think it's actually a disruptor. I think you can look at some verticals and you could look at them and say, maybe the CRM system that dominates that vertical should be the core, a core part of the comm stack of the enterprises there. Like when you really think about it, that's that's where a lot of the data is. Like maybe it's the patient data that you want to be closer to. And so I think if you look at it that way, um, and some of those companies are are looking at it that way. Their teams working on this problem today. I think that becomes the real disruptor um, in our industry is thinking about the data first in a vertical, um, and then the communications channel second. And that just turns everything inside out and I think is pretty exciting for our industry. Yeah, I, I agree, but I also think that it really depends. Um, so there are obviously some sectors of AI that have been commoditized as we already, as we already uh, mentioned at the beginning. Um, but when and picking uh, uh, the example of customer interactions in contact centers, for instance, when we, when we look at the value created uh, before a customer uh, interaction, during the customer interaction, and, and after the customer interaction, as, as Phil Doherty mentioned previously, I think there is a lot of value to be created there, and that's, that's where we need to explore and differentiate among, among ourselves. 
Um, I think the the, um, the real disruptor is going to become understanding that there's no one platform that will do it all, but the, how the ecosystem will work together to really deliver value. Uh, we, we recently, we partnered with Microsoft. We worked with them to build um, co-pilots very quickly to financial services to demonstrate how two platforms together can, within hours, deliver um, extreme value. Um, and the feedback from the financial services organisations that we, we work together to demonstrate this way were actually blown away by how fast um, and how valuable an output that they thought that was commercially, you know, a, a game changer for them was able to be developed. But that takes multiple platforms to come together. So I really think if we keep thinking that there's one one player only or one platform only, um, we'll be limiting the, the opportunities. I think understanding that there will be an ecosystem and how that ecosystem works together is going to be where we'll see some real game changing. Yeah, I would agree. I think we're, we're we're so early right now on all of this that there's so much hype around this, and there are actually some legs behind this, right? If you kind of look at like when you started with the search engine, right? Like there were so, so many different search engines out there, and not everybody made it, right? And I think that's kind of like where we're going to be. You're gonna you're gonna see a little bit of a bubble because you have a lot of people in the, into it, and then you're gonna see a consolidation, and you're gonna see some winners in in this, and it'll be an interesting couple of years. Brilliant. I definitely agree with that. It's going to be an interesting couple of years. Good time to be an analyst, if any of you are looking for a new career. Um, right. Thank you to all my panelists, Jason, Michael, uh, Philippe, John, and John. I think this has been a really great discussion, and now we're getting ready to hand over. So thank you very much. Thank you.